All right, thank you all for coming this morning and welcome to the second tech session by the Tactical Technology Office. I know you really wanna be here because it's 8 a.m. after a late night yesterday. Um, thanks for coming out this morning. I'm Tom Boitner, the Deputy Director of the Tactical Technology Office and 10 years ago I was fortunate enough also to be a Program Manager in TTO. It's great to be back at DARPA and to be part of DARPA's 60th anniversary. If you were fortunate enough yesterday to attend TTO's plenary session, you heard uh, Dr. Kennedy, our TTO director, talk about how the office is pursuing an enterprise disruption strategy. Uh, for those of you who are not able to attend, uh, simply put, that vision is to pursue disruptive capabilities and approaches that may be very different from our current strategies and approaches in each of the domains we work. Uh, we'll be discussing some of the concepts that extend capabilities of existing systems, making them more robust and, and lethal, uh, but we're also talking about visions that will be disruptive to our future capabilities for warfare. Now, by design, those capabilities will be disruptive to our adversaries, but by necessity, they might also be disruptive to our current tactics, uh, the way that we think about our current platforms and architectures. So I'll be leading this morning's discussion with some of our program managers from TTO who will discuss their visions for disruption in the air and ground domains. And yesterday we covered the space and, and maritime domains as well. Um, <clears throat> Over the past six decades of DARPA's existence, our defense industry has developed and refined its ability to design and build some of the most complex and capable systems we've ever seen. They've supported the country's needs for everything ranging from counterinsurgency to conventional warfare and even nuclear conflict. No country has ever done that better, and no country has ever invested as much in doing so. And although there have been attempts through those 60 years of trying to counter that trend towards increasing complexity and cost, those attempts have generally faltered as our acquisition community has emphasized performance over both cost and schedule. Now the problem with those exquisite systems is not just that they're expensive, but that they also take decades to go from the initial requirements uh, to a fielded capability. It's a luxury that we can no longer afford. Our adversaries therefore have decades to study those systems and in some cases deploy countermeasures even before we've reached an initial operating capability. We're now living in a world where domains that we once considered sanctuaries, air, sea, and space, are now contested, and platforms and systems that we once considered invulnerable are being targeted. So it follows that our force structures, which we once considered to be stable and resilient for decades, must now either adapt or be replaced. It's no longer practical to assume that we can anticipate future threats and field a force structure that will last for decades. More than ever before, as a country, as a DOD, we need to adapt and to surprise the enemy. We'll need to counter their assumptions and introduce uncertainty into their planning. We need to disrupt the enemy, forcing our adversaries to question their assumptions about how, when, or even if they can engage us. We're looking to present the threat with a future that is uncertain, with systems that they do not know how to defeat, and with a cost asymmetry that works against them not in their favor. TTO is engaged in trying to answer the question, what comes next? So today we'll talk about the air and ground domains. Both of these domains are characterized by a fundamental assumption that we must achieve dominance in order to accomplish our objectives. And that dominance comes with a cost. In the air domain, it's meant increasingly large investments to improve the stealthiness of our fighters and bombers. Uh, and in land warfare, it means putting our most valuable assets, our soldiers and Marines, in harm's way, in an environment that is the most symmetric environment of all the domains in which we operate. We've literally had troops who stood on the backs of their tanks to draw out fire so that they could identify where the snipers were. We envision a different approach for the future. One where we may no longer have dominance or an ability to exert control over a defined area at all times, but one in which we have an undeterrable presence. We want the ability to achieve specific objectives at times and places of our choosing, regardless whether the domain is contested. 
for the air domain. We want to be able to send airborne platforms and weapons into an environment, even if that environment is highly contested. We want weapons and platforms that can break the adversary's kill chains. And in land warfare, we want to put a buffer between our warfighters and achieving an objective that puts our soldiers in harm's way. As you'll hear in a few minutes, that buffer will include both on-man systems and man systems that augment and layer our presence and our ability to operate in uncertain environments. We're looking for ways to rapidly identify the location of the threat and their intent, and to network that information back to all the troops on the ground. And as you'll hear in a few minutes, we'd like to use every vehicle and soldier as a sensor and distribute the information throughout the network in real time. We're looking at other ways of protecting our soldiers as well, such as novel materials that would provide extreme strength while lightening the load of the body armor that they carry now. So at DARPA, our job is to avoid technology surprise from the adversary and to create technology surprise to impose upon them. Some of the ideas that we'll talk about today are pushing the limits of what can be done. And not everything will make it into a program of record or a future force structure. And that's OK. We're interested in exploring the art of the possible. We've constructed these sessions as opportunities for our program managers to share some of their specific insights and visions for their programs with all of you. And at the end, we'll have an opportunity to take a few questions, I hope, if time allows. So feel free to start submitting those questions as we're talking through the D60 app. But my hope is that the next hour is just the start of a discussion that will go on from here to engage us on ideas that are useful, that are game-changing, and that are feasible. We are always interested in hearing about your ideas. And with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our panel members who will provide a little bit more detail on their program visions. Lieutenant Colonel Phil Root, Alexander Wallen, Scott Wiersbanowski, Tim Chung, Peter Erblin, and Major Amber Walker. Just a few of the program managers who are helping to turn this vision into a reality. Uh, so Phil, let's start with you. Well, good morning. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Phil Root. It's a privilege to be here, a privilege to uh, continue to serve in the Army. I've come from an operational background as an Apache pilot at a much younger age. And now I've had the opportunity to uh, teach most, most recently at the uh, United States Military Academy uh, before coming here. Uh, part of the package deal teaching at the Academy was uh, the opportunity to get my graduate degrees. Uh, while there, spent a great deal of time looking at the optimality of UAS path planning, particularly in face of a, a thinking adversary. And that requires uh, us to think about game the theoretic, and perhaps that's the lens I use to see much of uh, the programs that we face and the struggles that we face and the opportunities that we have here in the ground domain. And I think it's nowhere uh, more relevant than in urban conflict. Urban conflict has been with us uh, from time and material. If you recall uh, Joshua storming uh, Jericho, that was uh, urban combat at its best. If we had that weapon system, that would be ideal. Um, and then in the modern era, the, uh, much of the strategic turning points of uh, significant campaigns have centered around urban conflict. If you look at uh, the Battle of Stalingrad in the east, if you look at uh, the Battle of Manila in, uh, in the Pacific, uh, we see that those battles were not only tactical, uh, strategic turning points. Uh, moving forward, the Battle of uh, the Korean War, uh, uh, the Battle of uh, Seoul was largely a, a strategic turning point, the Battle of Way City in Vietnam, the same. And then moving uh, much uh, closer in this war on terror, we see the battles of Baghdad, battles of Fallujah, uh, the battles of Mosul and Raqqa were all turning points in these campaigns. And we have reason to believe that we're going to see a great deal of urban conflict in the future, as we know that the uh, urbanization of the world continues. Uh, we expect urban centers to become not only more populated, but more complex uh, and increasingly littoral. So how do we respond? I think uh, one of the keys, and uh, we've discussed this in many of the panels uh, over the past several days, is the speed with which we can react. Uh, and in the Army lexicon, or the, the, really the military's lexicon, we refer to this as uh, Colonel John Boyd's OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, and act. And so I'd like to walk through a couple of the examples uh, where we are seeking to shrink that OODA loop and be able to decide much more quickly. Uh, so I, I'm fortunate to be a program manager for a couple programs. One is Squad X. Squad X uh, seeks to allow a small unit to dominate their local battle space. Recently had a series of highly successful uh, experiments out at 29 Palms. Uh, uh, it's amazing how low the airfare was to go to 29 Palms in August. 
Um, but <laughs> regardless, it was a, a great series of experiments, and, and it resonated for, uh, for two different reasons. Uh, and we have two different performers doing largely orthogonal things. One, we seek to dominate the local RF uh, radio frequency space. And in the context of the OODA loop, what we found is that if we can not only observe in the RF domain, but help understand that context, that orientation of uh, what these RF signals are, and allow a warfighter to respond more quickly, we saw that, uh, that we could dominate the OP4. In fact, they, could, uh, uh, they, had, they struggled to even form a cohesive uh, threat against uh, this RF sensing and awareness and reaction tools. Uh, second, uh, we uh, sought to uh, augment a squad's capability with uh, unmanned ground vehicle, UGV, UAS, all that were uh, purely autonomous. And what we found is that those tools all require the squad to have a great deal of situational awareness. The challenge is how do we allow a high op tempo in the face of uh, these awareness, uh, the situational awareness, and we found it. developing tools that allow the, these UGVs and UAS to behave as squad members and have uh, what we have begun to call a bias toward action. If you talk to any Marine, they have a bias toward action. If you think about our AI and autonomy, it does not have a bias toward action. It has a bias to sit around until you tell you what to do. So can we develop those tools that allow AI and autonomy to have a bias toward action, and in that way shrink the OODA loop uh, and, uh, within the squad environment? We call this program SquadX. Let me give you another example of another program I'm fortunate to be uh, associated with is the urban reconnaissance through supervised autonomy. Part of the challenge that we see in the urban environment is the, uh, the challenge of very fast reaction times, particularly in discriminating uh, combatants from non-combatants. This discrimination is absolutely essential to uh, what we hold dear, the, uh, the laws of land warfare. This is not that ROE binds us in any way, rather it's in our best tradition to adhere as rigorously as possible to these rules of engagement, but it puts an onus, as Dr. Boyner said, on drawing out the enemy in order to discriminate. So starting from this ethical perspective, this ethical requirement, how do we then discriminate as rapidly as possible, again, within the confines of or the framework of this OODA loop? And so the URSA program seeks to assist by uh, seeking a different way of discriminating. And what we've seen in the past is that intelligence surveillance reconnaissance, ISR, largely looks at the exterior of an individual and tries to determine their intent from the outside. With URSA, we seek to try to evoke a response and rather understand their intent from the inside out. What that requires is an entirely different approach. It requires that we uh, provide some stimuli, some message to an individual, combatant or non-combatant, warn them that this may not be an area they want to be, and gauge their reaction, see how they react, and then based on that reaction, determine uh, what further uh, steps and measures are appropriate. Viewed differently, not only am I an army officer, I'm also a father, I would, as a father in a war-torn area, I would want to know those areas I should not be. And so URSA is about providing warning for those that can get out of the way, get, this is not a good day to be above ground. And in that way, we can uh, allow non-combatants to assist with this discrimination. And they can choose to leave an area while providing absolutely no quarter to the enemy. So that's Squad X and URSA, but that does not mean that we've covered the waterfront in uh, urban challenges. I believe there's a number of challenges remaining. We'd love to continue the conversation. How do we increase the mobility associated with our, uh, our ground forces in urban places? How do we provide survivability, concealment? Uh, how do we provide secured logistics? A bevy of uh, challenges face us, and we'd love to continue the conversation. Over to you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Alexander Wallen, a program manager uh, here in TTO. Uh, I came to TTO after a 22-year Air Force career, and uh, during that time, I had the opportunity to work on most of the exquisite systems we heard about yesterday and today. Uh, in my case, I got to work on the B-2, the B-21, the F-35, and the F-22, uh, among others. Uh, and as I mentioned yesterday, I had the distinction of being able to work on the F-35 pre-IOC as a first lieutenant, and then 15 years later, pre-IOC as a lieutenant colonel. <laughs> Uh, and so, uh, in some ways, that was nice as a career capstone, uh, but we're really trying to avoid, in the future, having these platforms take career or careers of individuals to field. Um, and so that's uh, part of what we'll talk about today. Uh, 
Dr. Kennedy talked uh, quite a bit yesterday during his session about uh, uh, the traditional approach to air supremacy uh, and air dominance. Uh, the idea here that we're trying to uh, disrupt is to pivot away to something we call undeterrable air presence. I think uh, General Perkins, if you caught his talk uh, during the Stowe session, did a really good job of laying out the Cold War approach to air supremacy. The Soviets came out with MiG-X, we analyze it, we decide we want to be 20% better, we come out with the FY. Uh, they do X plus one, we do Y plus one. Uh, and that worked really well. And then uh, after the Cold War and after the Gulf War, uh, we decided air supremacy wasn't enough, so we came up with air dominance. Uh, not only were we going to own the skies, we are going to own them 24 hours, continuous presence. We didn't even want the other people to take off and operate in the sky. Uh, again, that worked well for 20 plus years, but I think as uh, Dr. Kennedy's and uh, General Cartwright's talk yesterday really pointed out, that approach is no longer feasible or affordable. And, and so the question is what comes next, and that's where undeterrable air presence comes. And so the, the fundamental concept here is rather than owning those skies 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we really just want to rent them. We want to operate at a time and place of our choosing regardless of what the enemy does. So, so we want to make that enemy or that adversary effectively irrelevant to what we want to do. And so to achieve this, I like to think of three pillars of thought. And I'll talk about each one. And the first is really on the domain pillar. And that's about operating the air domain in new or novel ways that exploit that in ways our adversaries don't or uh, that we haven't previously. I think you'll hear a little bit later in Peter's talks about hypersonics, and that's an excellent example of operating the air domain in a new way. The, uh, the other uh, approach is uh, new systems, and so that's taking existing technologies, putting them together in new and novel ways to create a disruptive capability. And I think Scott will touch on some of that in his talk next, uh, and that'll be a really good example. And then the final is, is a pure technology push and trying to get off the S-curves we're on with our existing technologies and jump to new things that enable new concepts, some of which we probably haven't even thought of because we don't have the tech to kind of push those ideas. Uh, so one example program I'd like to touch on that, that covers kind of the first two pillars is uh, ALTA, which stands for Adaptable Lighter Than Air, uh, and it's a stratospheric balloon, and it's an attempt to operationalize the stratosphere. So the near space stratospheric region is, uh, is uh, something, somewhere that NASA has been operating weather balloons for decades. Uh, they tend to be very expensive, very large, uh, and they use them for weather sensing and, and space qualifications. In the case of ALTA, what we're trying to do is take new and uh, some existing technologies and communications and navigation and make that more operationally relevant to the warfighter low-cost, distributed systems capable of carrying a wide variety of payloads and missions and operate in an area between 60 and 90,000 feet where traditionally we haven't operated, neither of our adversaries. Uh, so in the case of Alta, we're trying to exploit that air domain in a new and innovative way. And we're also doing it with a novel system approach that's low-cost, distributed, and, and potentially much more resilient. So the, the second uh, uh, the third pillar, rather, I mentioned is the advanced technology. And here I can think of three areas that are ripe for uh, investment and really disruptive uh, pushes. And the first is in propulsion. So for 75 years, we've really been uh, optimizing that turbojet engine, right? We had turbofans. Uh, we've spent decades investing billions of dollars to eke out single digit uh, increases in performance. But we haven't fundamentally changed the Breguet range equation we haven't fundamentally changed the fact that for longer range, we build bigger, heavier, more expensive airplanes. So the question is, how do we jump off that S-curve and get to that new revolutionary propulsion? Uh, and here, I think the commercial industry is, is leading the charge in many ways with some of the uh, hybrid electric concepts, distributed propulsion, uh, done in places like uh, Airbus, Boeing, and even Uber Elevate uh, with distributed electric propulsion. So the question is, are there investments there that we can make that really disrupt the traditional uh, approaches to propulsion and conquer that tyranny of range we see in the Pacific theater? So the second uh, advanced, technology pill, uh, advanced technology area I think that is uh, really of interest is advanced manufacturing that enable new designs and new approaches to designs that were previously unachievable. So 
3D printing of, of uh, metallics, of ceramics. Uh, can we make structures for aircraft and air systems that were previously not even considered because there's no way we could cast it, mill it, or otherwise assemble it? And then finally, there's some unique aerodynamic control concepts that are really exciting and that we're interested in pursuing. So we recently released an RFI, a request for information, uh, to see what industry and academia is doing in the field of active flow control. And what we want to see is if there's a new way to design airplanes where you don't need the traditional heavy, draggy, uh, mechanical flight control systems. Can we fly airplanes with no moving surfaces and just using air to control vehicles? Uh, so that's an area we don't yet have a program in, but we're definitely interested in pursuing. And uh, if, for those of you in the audience that have ideas, we'd be, love to hear them. So I've talked on the three examples of technologies, but by no means are those the only things we're interested in hearing. The, uh, the hope is through forums like this and discussions during this panel and after, as well as follow-ups, uh, we get your ideas, whether in academia, industry, or DOD, for new and novel concepts, technologies, and approaches to uh, enable this uh, vision of undeterrable air presence. So uh, thank you, and I think Scott will talk about some of those novel concepts. Thank you. Uh, my name's Scott Wersbanowski. I've been a program manager here at uh, DARPA for about the last year and a half, coming on two years here in November. Uh, and during that time, I've uh, got a couple programs working on. The Experimental Space Plane Program, uh, Gremlins, which is looking at air recovery of uh, UAVs to host aircraft, and Collaborative Operations in a de Denied Environment Code. Um, my past is, is uh, very similar to Xander's here, where I was from the Air Force, I was a F-16 test pilot and spent a significant amount of my career with training operations, uh, requirements development of fourth and fifth generation aircraft. Uh, and that kind of set the foundation for, for uh, the, one of the reasons why I'm being here. Uh, but what really set the passion was back in the early 2000s when I was uh, one of the test pilots of the Autonomous Air Collision Avoidance System, Auto ACAS. Uh, and in this program, which was derived off of the Auto Ground Collision Avoidance System, was, was, was us to take a look at the technologies of what, it would, what would be necessary in order for two manned aircraft to avoid each other uh, when you would have these situations where you just don't see someone and you would, you would uh, crash into them. It was highly successful. We were able to show that the system was able to identify both cooperative and non-cooperative targets. Uh, it was able to indicate to the pilot that he needed to turn away from wherever that other aircraft was, and if the pilot didn't do so, it would take control of the aircraft, deconflict, uh, give the control back to the, uh, to the pilot as soon as, as, soon as practical. Uh, so while it was highly successful as a technology program, it took us over 15 years to get that technology put into our programs of record. Right now we have the Auto GCAS that's going into the F-16 and an integrated collision air avoidance system that's eventually going to be put into the F-35. But it took 15 years. When I was trying to sell this program to uh, my, my colleagues, one of the biggest problems they had was, was a lack of trust. They didn't want HAL to take over their airplane and go crash into the ground or crash into anything else. And so they, they didn't get the, while they appreciated the technology, they just didn't believe that it was going to be working for them. Uh, and so, so keep that thread as, as we move forward here. So you take a look at our... Uh, our architecture that we have right now uh, in order to provide support in air combat operations. We do rely on these, these manned bombers and fighters uh, to, to, to be able to prosecute the threat in, in whatever environment that we, uh, we want to get into. Uh, and there are advantages to that, right? We, we, we trust the system. Uh, they're exquisite, they're very capable, they're the best systems that we have out there. And we trust our pilots, they're the best trained pilots that we have out there. And those two together create a situation where we know we can get the mission done that we want to get done. Uh, exquisite, yes. Expensive, yes. And, and they are limited in numbers. And so this alternative architecture that I think is equally viable is the idea of distributing the capabilities amongst both manned and unmanned aircraft and increasing the complexity of the problem to provide more environments or, or more, 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 more nodes, if you will, that are out there that the enemy is going to have to deal with. Uh, and in doing so, what you find out is that it creates a more complex problem for, the, uh, for our adversaries to deal with. Um, they become more affordable, and you decouple this whole issue that we have right now of risk to the pilot and an exquisite system, and you're able to kind of push your unmanned vehicles closer to the threat so that you could use them in, uh, in ways that you would never have done before. You change that risk equation. You could keep the manned pilots 
further back. You could use them where they make their most impact, but then you could go ahead and throw more affordable systems closer to the threat, and if they get uh, shot down or if they don't make it back, that's okay because they weren't nearly as expensive and you didn't have a manned aircraft in there. And so that ability to, to, to split up and decouple these things becomes a very important way of looking at things, and it does change that cost equation, and it provides tools for the services to kind of take a look at it in a slightly different way. So a couple of programs that I have right now kind of go in that vein. It's looking at that architecture, and they're in enabling technologies. You have the Gremlins program, which is really looking at the air recovery of small UAVs to a host aircraft. And there's a couple of key reasons why we're doing that. First off, what we want to make sure is that we can do it safely, effectively, and reliably so that when the pilot uses it or an operator uses it, he knows it's going to work. Um, but more importantly, what it does is it allows us to use smaller vehicles, especially when we're going against large ranges. Those tyranny of distance is really something that affects us when we put requirements to vehicles. We need a vehicle to go 2,000 miles, 3,000 miles, and that increases the overall size. And one of the metrics why we try to get away from it still is the same. It's a cost per pound of building the vehicle. So if we can keep these vehicles smaller, they're going to be inevitably more affordable. You also look at it from the context if they're small and I have a host aircraft, I could add more to that vehicle or to the host aircraft and thus bring more items, more quantity to the fight. Something that we never really did. We always were thinking about quality over quantity uh, in our previous ideas and culture of how we wanted to do an air fight. So by keeping uh, the air recovery safe, reliable, uh, consistent and efficient, we're gonna be able to provide a tool to the warfighter to, to at least take a look at it and see whether or not it's something he wants to use. Another program is collaborative operations in a denied environment, which is looking more at the software part of this as opposed to the hardware. It's what do you do when you have comms denied or comms, comms inhibited, where previously you used to rely on that dedicated data link back to a command station where you'd have one pilot or one operator or more working on a single UAV. And like General Carr had talked about yesterday, we want to change that metric to instead of number of people per vehicle, it's the number of vehicles you could use per an individual operator. And collaborative operations in denied environment is gonna look at that. It takes a look at that end game. How, if you have reduced comms, can these systems figure out the best way to go after a threat and don't have to have someone waiting to tell them what to do? Or if a pop-up threat uh, is now uh, observed within, within the environment, it could figure out whether or not it needs to go around it or distribute it, the capabilities it has amongst the swarm and go ahead and take care of that threat as well without always having to rely on the operator somewhere else to tell them what to do. It's a start, it's getting us going in the right direction, but when you take a look at this whole idea of a distributed architecture, there's, there's the enabling technologies that you have to work with. Uh, we talked how to look a little bit about the air launch and air recovery part of that and a little bit about the autonomy, but command, control, and communications. You want to have that data link, if at all possible, so that the operator has insight as to what's going on and can deal with the robust, uh, deal with the unknown unknowns that happen. Uh, more importantly, I think, is just autonomy in a, grain, in a grand spectrum of all the things that need to happen. If you take a look at how we do mission planning right now, it takes an operator to figure out where he wants to put his vehicle, and then where he's, with that vehicle, he has several weapons, and each of these weapons have to go after a different target. Uh, all that mission planning happens. Now think about multiplying that by an order of magnitude because you have maybe a volley of, of unmanned vehicles going out there. So we do have to put some sort of autonomous capabilities into our mission planning that allows a single person to be able to build up a package within a very short amount of time. You have the administrative type of autonomy that's necessary for just UAVs and manned aircraft to work together. Simple things like formation keeping, or what happens when your engine starts getting a warning or a heat light. Do you deal with that as an operator back over at uh, one of the command stations, or do you allow the UAV to take care of that themselves? That is something that still needs to be taken care of. It we have, we have pushes into that idea of how to make it happen, but we're always relying on a command station somewhere for that pilot to help out, or an operator help. And finally, the part that I think we need the most amount of work on is, is the autonomy necessary for the decisions, the tactical decisions. When a threat arrives, right now as an operator, we, we have an idea of what that threat is, what he can do against us, and then we decide which tactic is going to work best against that threat. We have to build up that same type of reasoning within our systems so that when they get into an unknown situation, they're able to assess it, assess the threat, and go, this is the best the best technique we need to use as opposed to what's just happened to be a, a, a basic playbook type tactic. So as we move forward over the next couple of years, those, those enabling technologies 
are going to allow us to at least take a look at this architecture to see if it's something that the warfighter is going to want to use. And in the end, what we want to be able to do is prove not only that the technology is there, but that they can have trust in the system, that, that they know that if they use this system, they understand why it's happening and, and build up this, this ability to, to trust what's going on. And therefore, instead of waiting 20 to 30 years for something to come to fruition, maybe it's only five years. Or we're able to experiment with it earlier and get it to the warfighter sooner so that he can kind of understand what's going on. Uh, that's it for now. So if you have any questions, uh, I've been much more, much uh, able to talk to you in a little, a little while. Yeah. Good morning. My name is Tim Chung. I've been at DARPA about two and a half years, or more precisely, 921 days. And that's, uh, it's a fun job where every day actually does matter. So, you know, keeping count is pretty fun. My general interest areas are in robotics and autonomy. And for those of you who attended the panel session yesterday, you, you were able to hear some of the future directions, I think, in the, in the way DARPA is going to invest in those areas. Prior to coming to DARPA, I was at the Naval Postgraduate School out in California. And my research was really strongly influenced by the military junior officers that I was uh, fortunate to, to instruct, as well as my colleagues. And one of the great stories here is that my mentor, who was a retired Navy uh, captain, came across the hallway and he said, hey, uh, didn't you work on teams of robots that play soccer autonomously? And oh, by the way, I just got off the horn. Uh, how would you counter uh, a saturation attack with a bunch of kamikaze UAVs going after a surface combatant? And the fact that there was this parallel with robot soccer and defense of our fleet uh, is an interesting one, and that sparked this area of research that I'm interested in, largely uh, focusing in my nascent academic research career, but ultimately here at DARPA. And so um, I think the idea kind of Pulling from the, the startup community, the terminology, if NPS is a good incubator of ideas, we come to DARPA because it's a great accelerator of those ideas. And so I'm really excited to be here. And I think the main idea is that upon arrival at DARPA, we initiated the Service Academy Swarm Challenge. This is uh, an effort to bring the cadets and midshipmen, offer them up the opportunity to fly 25 versus 25 mixed flying drones over the skies of Camp Roberts where they're basically playing capture the flag with 25 versus 25 drones. And the idea there is for them to not only be exposed to the future realities or the future possibilities of swarm and counter swarm type technologies, but also to uh, understand the types of tactics or behaviors that they're going to consider when they have an opponent that's equally equipped. And so I think that experience was interesting. And even though that just concluded last April, we're already seeing some of those technologies transitioned over to the Marines where we're understanding the ways in which those capabilities can be used in uh, operational settings, which is really remarkable. So this DARPA is an accelerator idea, I think has um, been an exciting one. I think it's shared with my colleagues. And so there are three different ideas that I think uh, have inf informed how I design my programs, my interest areas. I think really first and foremost is that co-design between technology and tactics. So it's not just about developing the technology and then trying to figure out how to use it or having set established TTPs and then cons being constrained in how we develop the technology to fit within that construct. It's really that rapid, agile evolution of technology and tech tactics together. And so that's really afforded specifically in the autonomy and robotics world, uh, largely because we have access to things like open source middleware, uh, advances in uh, synthetic virtual environments and our ability to access that broad and open development community. So leveraging that, I think, is one of the major aspects uh, that you'll see in how I've designed some of these programs. I also think it's important, shared with my colleagues on stage already, to be able to anticipate, access, and then accelerate where some of those technology trends are, often influenced by the fact that uh, the adversary is also paying attention to where things are going. And so the areas of robotics and autonomy we've mentioned, but machine learning, I think, is continuing to be a major dominant player and will continue to accelerate how we work even in a platform-centric systems office. I think uh, we'll see applications of machine learning going forward. And thirdly, I think the uh, idea that's already been mentioned is that the adversary gets a vote. And so how do we consider that when we're developing these technologies? It's not only how they choose to fight, but also where they choose to fight. And I think we're, we're seeing uh, a concerted effort within the office and the agency to be able to address how that happens. And so you'll see a persistent 
game theoretic red teaming perspective to the approaches that I'm interested in taking. And that includes everything from swarm and counter swarm or the adversary's use of complex terrain to potentially negate our technological advances. And I think uh, with that in mind, and let me just share with you very briefly, the offensive swarm enabled tactics program, which is one of the programs I have the privilege of, of working on, is developing technologies that will enable ultimately upwards of 250 small air and ground robots in an urban environment for small units. And so in this effort to do that enterprise disruption, it's not only about understanding the domains, but also the seams between those domains, where this is an air and ground initiative, where we have air and ground robots supporting those small units. And ultimately, as Scott just mentioned, we're interested in those types of tactics. What are the types of tactics that we can employ when we're enabled by uh, a swarm of heterogeneous complex autonomous agents? When I say swarm, we often think about the low agent complexity, large numbers, and then kind of stop there. But here at DARPA, we've really been able to broaden what we mean when we say swarm to include the complexity of the collective, the collective complexity of how they interact and how they share information and who follows whom, if at all. It's less like an orchestra uh, and more like a jazz ensemble where you have that improv that's going on that you can uh, leverage. Um, the other aspect of swarms that I think is critical is going to be the heterogeneity, not just in the platform or the payload, but also the function. So you might have identical platforms and payloads, but now you're using them in different ways, and now that's another degree of freedom that we can capitalize on. And then finally, the fifth area I'd say would be in human swarm interaction and understanding that man unmanned teaming in the context of swarms specifically and forcing us to think about how we do that interaction quite dramatically differently. And so I'm ultimately interested in the swarminess. What, what I mean by that is, how do I take advantage of the disaggregated and heterogeneous capabilities? And ultimately, how do I exploit or leverage the urbanness uh, of the, the complexity of that environment uh, to our advantage? And so uh, the other aspect of offset is the human swarm teaming thrust. I articulate that, uh, that there are different ways in which we're going to interact with 250 robots in the field than if we had just two or five robots in the field. And so how do we think about new ways to convey our intent and receive and appreciate what the swarm's intent is? And I think there's a wide open arena there as well. <clears throat> One of the other areas that I think we're interested in is uh, in the, the next grand challenge, I would argue, is uh, the DARPA subterranean challenge. And so that's a privilege that I have to conduct that effort. And so rather than using perhaps a traditional uh, program model, this is now the DARPA challenge model, I'd say, with a capital C. And what we're trying to do is inspire the world's best ideas to come together and face some of the daunting challenges of the underground domain where we're interested in exploring and searching these complex underground environments. And so this wide open aperture means that uh, we don't quite know what the solution will be, but it's our job, I'd say, from a DARPA and a government perspective, is to open up the, uh, the playground for us to go and explore and discover those types of approaches. And so uh, the challenge is structured in such a way uh, the consistent feedback I've received from our stakeholders has been, hey, we need some versatility in these systems. It can't be point solutions anymore. That's where we're going to get the greatest utility. And so we've structured and designed this challenge to not only face the problems of uh, human-made tunnel systems, but also the urban underground, including things like transit systems and, and uh, infrastructure, as well as naturally occurring caves, and spanning all of the challenges of those underground environments and recognizing that there's some commonality there that we wish to find some versatile solutions uh, associated with tackling those arenas. So we have a systems challenge, a systems competition, where teams are uh, compelled to uh, explore solutions that will span all three of those subdomains. We also have a virtual competition that will take advantage of the advance, advances in synthetic environments to go off and, and really push the boundaries in some of these areas. And then so uh, ultimately this is a prize challenge and so we're interested in seeking out competitors who will come out and uh, show, their, show their wares and their capabilities. 
and uh, explore what it means to compete and take away the glory of uh, potentially winning the DARPA Subterranean Challenge. And as a final plug, I'd say we have our competitors day at the end of this month on September 27th, where we'll be announcing more of the details about the challenge. So if you're interested, I encourage you to come take a look at subtchallenge.com. And I look forward to engaging with you further. I think the main areas that I'm interested in are, again, the adversary gets a vote. How do we incorporate that? How do we co-design the tactics and technology? And ultimately, how do we anticipate where technology is going? Some of those technologies I've alluded to include the machine learning and third wave of AI aspects of interpreting swarm and counter swarm. Thank you very much. Well, good morning. My name is Peter Erbland. Um, I lead our Joint Tarp Air Force Tactical Boost Glide Program, and I've spent the majority of my career working in uh, technology and system development for high-speed systems. Uh, this is actually my second tour here at DARPA. I first came up here in 2008 from Air Force Research Laboratories uh, to serve as a deputy program manager and then the program manager for the Falcon HTV2 program. That was a global range boost glide demonstrator. And I returned in 2014 to lead our current tactical boost glide program. So my interests really uh, align in the areas of uh, enabling technologies for hypersonic systems and then the development of those systems. So to that point, you've probably seen in recent press reports um, that a number of our senior leaders have emphasized the critical importance of maturing hypersonic technologies and system capabilities for our United States national security. And it's important when you hear that term, hypersonics, to understand that uh, hypersonics is not an end in itself. Uh, rather, it's a means to enabling uh, flight in what we call the near space domain. That is at altitudes between 100 and 400,000 feet. That's above where we operate our aircraft systems, below where we operate our spacecraft systems, but a domain that it's uh, going to be essential to control in the future if we wish to successfully project power against peer adversaries. And why is that? Well, in terms of our aircraft operations, it represents the high ground. And in terms of access to space, it's a domain that we have to transit. And so as we think about um, um, disruptive technologies um, and disruptive strategies, domination of this near space domain is going to be critical to us in the future. It's also important when you hear hypersonics to understand that we've been working in this area, maturing technologies and systems that operate at hypersonic speeds since the 1950s. Think about our ballistic reentry vehicles on which our strategic deterrence is based. Um, the NASA Space Transportation System or Space Shuttle, that was a reusable hypersonic space plane. So this is not new to us. But what is new today, what is different, is that the United States and peer nations are at what we would call a tipping point in terms of maturing technologies to realize new classes of hypersonic weapon capabilities. Um, hypersonic uh, boost glide vehicles and hypersonic cruise missiles today, and in the near future, reusable hypersonic aircraft. All of these will operate in and through near space. And so it's DARPA's vision. Uh, what we seek to do is enable to the, the United States to dominate this near space domain. We seek to create um, both expendable and reusable systems uh, with which we can execute um, space launch, ISR, and force projection missions for both offensive and defensive applications. And the technologies that will enable us to do that include things like advanced aerodynamic configurations, high temperature materials and structures, hypersonic air breathing propulsion, um, advanced guidance and control strategies, um, thermal management in order to manage the high thermal loads we experience, and then the subsystems and seekers that are required to turn these into systems. But it's more than about the technologies. We also need to think about um, uh, innovative strategies for uh, operational architectures and battle management command control and communication frameworks that will allow us to integrate and employ both existing and emerging ISR communications and weapons platforms. Platforms. So today DARPA is uh, conducting a number of programs in this area. Um, I will talk about two of them. Uh, the first is the hypersonic air breathing weapon concept or HAWK program and the second is the uh, tactical boost glide program. Now um, each of these programs uh, share a common goal of maturing technologies that will enable future weapons that we believe will provide us with transformational improvements in our capability for prompt and effective strike of time critical and heavily defended targets. But they take two very different approaches to this. Um, the Hawk program seeks to mature technologies for a scramjet powered hypersonic cruise missile whereas Boost Glide, tactical Boost Glide, seeks to mature technologies for a rocket powered Boost Glide missile. 
Uh, they have a, a common strategy in how we tackle this problem, though. Uh, we seek to demonstrate the feasibility of, of each of these systems. Uh, we seek to understand and address those issues required to make these systems effective as weapons. And then finally, we're attacking the problem of cost or affordability, because if we're thinking about tactical class weapons, we have to deliver these at a price point that's comparable to what we'll spend today for a tactical weapon. With respect to the Hawk program, the hypersonic air breathing weapon concept, that's a joint DARPA Air Force project to develop and demonstrate technologies for an affordable and effective air-launched hypersonic cruise missile. Um, some of the key technologies uh, that will enable that include uh, the advanced aerodynamic configura configuration for hypersonic flight, uh, hydrocarbon-fueled hydrocarbon scramjet propulsion technology, um, the thermal management systems that we need for high temperature crews, and then finally, um, affordable design uh, and manufacturing approaches to ensure that we can hit our, our cost point. Um, this program will also have a flight demonstration, um, a, rapid and effective, a rapid and affordable flight demonstration to validate those technologies. The program today has conducted its uh, critical designs, and uh, they are preparing to flight test in 2019 and 2020. The tactical boost glide program that I lead, uh, the objectives there are to develop and demonstrate technologies for future air-launched tactical range hypersonic boost glide weapons. It will also include a flight demonstration. The, uh, for, a, for a boost glide system, just to discriminate from a cruise missile, um, a rocket is used to accelerate the payload to a high altitude and high velocity. Once the payload separates from the rocket, it glides the remainder of its distance unpowered to its destination. And so the critical technologies that we're pursuing for the, for the tactical boost glide program include, again, advanced aerodynamic configurations, in this case, to give us very long range. We're working on uh, robust guidance and control approaches to uh, realize a large operational envelope. Uh, weight and volume efficient thermal protection systems to protect these designs against the severe thermal environments they experience in flight. And then, again, advanced manufacturing so that we can drive down the costs in producing these systems. Again, Tactical Boost Glides has conducted our critical design review. We're planning to flight test in 2019 and 2020. Now, as far as uh, future opportunities in this area, um, I'll offer these thoughts. Um, first of all, uh, Tactical Boost Glide and Hawk are maturing technologies for what I would call a first-generation weapon capability in these areas. But we need to be investing in technologies um, that will enable higher performance and lower cost for these future expendable systems. We also need to be um, investing in the technologies to enable uh, reusable air breathing platforms in order to realize those future reusable aircraft. We also have to um, uh, think about how we're going to operationalize these and, and implement them in terms of battle management, command control, and communication. And in all of these areas, we need your innovative ideas. Uh, opportunities in the technology space would include uh, improving aerodynamic configurations uh, and rocket and air-breathing propulsion to achieve larger ranges for our expendable systems, uh, working on combined cycle propulsion technology for our reusable systems, addressing problems with respect to materials and structures, which are truly enabling for these kind of designs, uh, refractory metallic refractory high temperature metallic and, and composite material systems, the high temperature coatings that can protect those from oxidation, uh, and then um, also the, the tools and methods that we need to design efficient structures um, out of these unusual materials. As we think about controls and, and guidance, especially in controls, we need to think about um, how we design control systems that will address high levels of coupling between aerodynamics, uh, the thermal behaviors, the structural dynamic characteristics, and the propulsion attributes, especially for these reusable platforms. We need to think about advanced manufacturing even beyond what we're doing today, including additive manufacturing. That's been mentioned a couple of times. That can be truly enabling for creating new uh, structural realizations that we could not get to before with standard manufacturing techniques. Uh, that's important for not only improving production outcomes, but also reducing cost. We need to think about advanced diagnostics and instrumentation for the severe environments these vehicles will experience, whether it be the propulsion elements or, or the vehicle structures in flight. And then we need to think about the seekers and the windows that we need to uh, uh, give these uh, systems eyes, if you will. Um, 
beyond the technology, it's really important that as we think about this technical area, um, that we're also investing in the, the future workforce that we're going to need because um, uh, having adequate workforce, even for the programs we have in this country today, is truly a challenge. We need to think about having adequate um, ground and flight test infrastructure to support this. And we need to think about the industrial base, which is going to be required to enable the manufacturing and delivery of these weapon systems. So it's with investments in these areas, work in these areas, that we believe um, we're going to be postured to develop a family of systems that will enable flight in and through and ultimately allow us to dominate this near space domain. And thank you. Hi, I'm Major Amber Walker. Uh, joined TTO about a year ago, and I have the privilege to go last today. We know last is best. Um, and uh, I could tell it's a Twitter crowd, so I have a couple of buzzwords I'm gonna throw out later today that I'm hoping you'll help me get trending. Um, before D60 ends, so wait for it. I hope that I hope I don't have to point them out. I hope that you just gravitate towards them. Um, before that, though, I have kind of a diverse portfolio. These guys all have kind of a depth of experience in very specific operational areas. And my background, both as an Army officer and in academia, has been much more broad. So I have breadth over depth, I would say. Um, I started uh, at West Point in aerospace engineering, looking at aeronautical design. I went on to Oxford in the United Kingdom and studied material science and impact and fracture mechanics for uh, unique metallic alloys in use in the automotive and aircraft industry. Uh, for my PhD, I switched and became a user-focused designer uh, and did human-robot interaction and multimodal control. And so you'll see elements of all of that show up in my programs at DARPA. Um, I also have taught at the, at the United States Military Academy with Lieutenant Colonel Root. Um, I was a signal officer way back when, and I did RF communications and satellite communications, both here and in Baghdad, Iraq. Um, and so all of that's kind of shaped the portfolio that I lead at DARPA. Um, the first of which was a, a privilege of mine to take over the Ground X Vehicle Technology Program. So that program has concluded, but you did get to see some of the hardware in the exhibit hall over the last couple of days. Um, hopefully you drooled over it as much as I did. It's pretty cool. Um, I, I expect to see it in a future comic book, I think. Um, the next Bat, uh, Batmobile, or batman Beal, I think as my son calls it, uh, might have some advanced suspension if we're lucky. Uh, now I run a program called Operational Fires, which is a tactical weapon delivery system, ground launched in partnership with the Army. Uh, to deliver a variety of payloads at a variety of ranges and get after overmatch through standoff. Uh, so we are looking at um, exploring the use of hypersonic payloads to provide lethal effects beyond 499 kilometers uh, from the ground. Some of the technologies we're exploring and are kind of currently pursuing are propulsion system pr uh, designs that will enable a robust operational envelope, uh, both the speeds and altitudes necessary for this vision. Uh, we are entering phase one of that technical area this fall, and we expect a follow-on solicitation that will get after more of the system integration and integrated end-to-end -end flight tests. Um, that will, will release early next year, hoping to do end-to-end -end system testing near 2022. Um, following from operational fires, um, I'm hoping to, to get back uh, across that breadth of my portfolio and look at the human. So my vision of the ground domain is very human-centered, as I mentioned. Um, I think of the four domains, the one unique thing about the ground is that you will never, and I truly believe this, never operate on the ground without having to consider the human element, right? Undersea, in space, even in the sky, you can generally avoid human interaction if you try. Uh, I don't think that's possible on the ground. and so. How do we build towards that complexity and what are the enabling technologies that allow for that collaboration, uh, the, the dynamic environment that results from having humans on the battlefield? And so really I'm looking to engage uh, in future programs to enable our warfighters through standoff in a different way. So rather than range, I want time. And I think Fred talked about that a little bit yesterday in his plenary session. How do I speed up the decision cycle? How do I speed up each individual soldier's reaction? How do I coordinate it through distributed battlefield awareness? Um, I believe through data fusion that we have done a lot to detect and make intelligent decisions about what's going on in our environment. I do not believe we have made as much progress in how we distribute and share that information down to the lowest level, either, either manned or unmanned. Uh, so get ready for the hashtag data fission. 
Um, I would like to do data fission to understand something about each person on the battlefield and what information is relevant to him or her at any given time. And then I want to go after unique interfaces that are not necessarily visual, but rather multi-sensory uh, to communicate that information in an intuitive way without overloading them, uh, you know, given where they are and what they're trying to accomplish. I also have the privilege of working with Chris Clay, who's a fellow PM here in, in TTO, uh, on another initiative related to robotic rearmament and refueling. So rather than very static FOB-based operations or um, ammunition and resupply points, how can we take more of that on the move? Can we look at co-design of a platform and its maintainer, the interfaces, precision control, and, and concept of operations that would allow us to deploy these very disaggregated systems that you heard Tim and Phil and, and everyone else talk about, uh, and then man them um, without men, right? How do I rearm and refuel a austere platform floating on the ocean that may be the landing point and the takeoff point for a small unmanned aircraft? Uh, and so I think we can do that, but I think we have to shift our thinking. I think we have to take, this is maybe the one part where I think you have to take the humans out of it entirely and really design robot to robot. So uh, very excited kind of about both of those emerging ideas. Um, I think I've talked to some of you in the audience about it. Certainly welcome to talk to more of you. Uh, looking forward to wrapping this up. Uh, and I had another hashtag. Data fission was number one. Personalized operating picture was the other one I wanted to throw out, right? So that distributed battlefield awareness is all to provide a common operational picture, but that vision I kind of described for how we uh, talk to the user is more of a personalized operating picture. So, heard it here first. It's going on YouTube, so you can't steal it later. It's been a pleasure, thank you. Thanks, Amber. And we've got time for a few questions. Um, I'd like to start with one for yep. Phil. Um, Space, air, and ground, thinking about physical domains is how we've thought about warfare for a long time. I wonder if it might be time to think about social domains and units, uh, the unstated psychological dimensions that guide our actions. And so that was certainly part of the URSA uh, BAA and part of our thinking and <coughs> eliciting behaviors. And Phil, great. So, on that? Uh, we have about 30 questions, so that's 15 seconds apiece or so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, philosophical questions don't lend themselves to, to fast answers. Uh, one thing we know from military philosophy and just life in general, that soldiers, Marines wage combat as a moral imperative. They, f they fight until they're morally, uh, they have lost the moral imperative to continue fighting. Mm -hmm. Now one of the fastest ways to remove someone's moral drive to continue fighting is to relieve them of their pulse. <laughs> but uh, that is not the only way to remove someone's moral drive to continue uh, continue fighting. So in URSA, for example, we seek to discriminate uh, combatant from non-combatant, and as we uh, seek to provide this discrimination, we also force the, uh, the combatants, the adversary, to decide if this is the day they want to engage. They have lost the element of surprise. We have identified that they are moving through uh, an operational environment, and the best outcome, I'd argue, is one where they decide this is not a day that I want to try to engage the U.S. military. This is a day where I'm going to turn around and try another time. In that case, we've actually achieved deterrence in a ground domain, which is a, 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 uh, an ideal objective. What if we could clear an area without firing a shot? That is, a, I'm not claiming that URSA would achieve that, but it, it goes to the social aspect. Let me give you one uh, additional example, highly uh, pre-decision, but we're considering uh, a uh, form of logistical resupply by uh, offensive tunneling, offensive tunneling to provide supplies. There's a, so a psychological aspect of that. You may not consider that. Imagine if we were clearing Fallujah and we could tunnel to provide supplies. Imagine if we did that covertly, we could provide supplies wherever we needed. Imagine if we did that overtly and the adversary knew that we had supply points and uh, pre-positioned in depth it would cause a psychological dilemma for them. Do, is this the day that I want to continue to sit here and wait for the U.S. military because I know they're well positioned and poised to attack? So there's a psychological element associated with even the, uh, the most simple of uh, resupply. Mm -hmm. And I think the swarm, uh, the, the pervasive swarm also gets into the adversary's mindset and psychology. So Amber, I wonder if you want to follow up on that a little bit, not so much on the psychological, but maybe the physiological domain and, and how we think about our force structure and track it. 
Yeah, so I mean, today I think our order of battle is very regimented, it's very sequential, it's very chronological, and it's built around this idea of battle drills and tactics, techniques, and procedures. And I posit that a lot of that is because we don't have effective means to communicate to the lowest level, right? So we have to, we have to communicate to the lowest level we can reach, which is generally the squad leader, and then he or she has to have an understanding of how their forces are going to be arrayed at any given time uh, due to any given change on the battlefield kind of innately without having to direct it. Um, if we took that out and said, no, you can direct it in real time in meaningful and intuitive ways without overloading the soldier, um, what does a squad look like? What does a platoon look like? What does a company look like? Do we need a command post? Right? Or does that command post now become wherever the commander is in whatever mobile fashion he or she is traveling? So that's kind of the paradigm I'm trying to challenge and the disruption that we're trying to bring upon ourselves. The Army really loves me. Um, they, like, they like my ideas. Yeah, right? <laughs> might that be enabled by a personal operating picture? It might, yes. Yeah. Yes, Peter, that's excellent. <laughs> I think you should coin that. I just did. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one last question for a lightning round here. I'll give everybody a chance to, to respond uh, quickly. Um, is there a specific technical challenge that is particularly critical or pacing the development of your vision or your programs? Let's go. Uh, I'll start. Uh, autonomy in the ground domain allows us to decide more quickly, potentially. Uh, that is, uh, if we look at the framework, the OODA loop framework, we have to decide very quickly. We can decide, but there's great uncertainty around the information available to us. And so I think that that orient phase, that understanding of what the observations are in a cultural context, potentially, or uh, in the operational environment, is incredibly challenging and one that is uh, not well addressed yet. Uh, our ability to make autonomous decisions will be paced by our ability to orient and place these observations in context. Mm. Uh, yeah, so I think General Cartwright yesterday uh, you said it really well, if you got distributed resilient systems, how do you get them there, right? And so the tyranny of range, especially in the Pacific, uh, as we go to distributed, resilient, maybe smaller systems, how do we get them to the fight, let them persist in the fight without making them really big gas tanks like we do today? So it's, it's breaking that range uh, barrier for these smaller, more affordable systems. I got that one hacked for you, man. I'll take care of that. <laughs> uh, when it comes to the Gremlins program, though, it really comes down to the guidance navigation control, the ability to reduce the error uh, that the Gremlins air vehicle has compared to how it's going to engage with uh, the docking mechanism. If we can keep that small, then we know that more times than not we'll be able to engage. Uh, if that thing starts getting larger, now you're going to be missing it. Uh, and so that's something that we're going to have to track over the course of the next four or five months. I think in addition to what Phil said about the orientation uh, piece, I think the way in which we test and evaluate how we work with these autonomous systems and apply uh, the techniques associated with accelerating and maturing technology from maybe just simulation and being able to deploy in physical environments, I think that gap between those uh, synthetic and physical worlds are going to need to compress in order for us to accelerate the uh, maturation of these technologies and so infrastructure development in that context I think is critical. And for the hypersonics area, um, I'll treat it on two levels. One, in terms of the technologies, if you think about the, the high-speed cruise missiles, obviously the air-breathing propulsion is, is one of the key challenges for us, making sure that we understand that not only how to get the systems to perform, but how to manage the thermal loads in those propulsion systems. And, and therefore, the, um, the manufacturing technologies that we can uh, bring to bear today are going to be uh, just critically important to realizing these innovative designs and opening new design spaces to us. Um, on a similar line, um, for both systems, the cruise missiles and the boost glide, materials and structures, working with these high temperature metallic and, and um, uh, composite systems is really important. Um, we, we've got limited experience working with these. We have to deal not only with mechanical, but with thermal stresses and the design of these. And, and, uh, uh, and so how we use these, um, these materials and integrate them in a way that give us robust structural designs, both for the expendable and the reusable systems is important. <coughs> And the other level at which I wanted to treat this is going back to operational architectures and BMC cube. As we begin to think about um, weapons that can prosecute targets in single digit minutes um, from very long ranges, then we think, have to think about how are we going to create kill chains that support this. And so it really requires a rethinking on our part of how we, how we architect operations with these new, new systems to allow us to prosecute time critical targets. 
and um, and so so both in the technology side and and in the in the operations and and um, uh, mission planning side, uh, we have we have really juicy challenges to tackle here. So, uh, so when I'm not coining uh, catchphrases, I am eat sleep and breathe uh, rocket motors currently, right, for my propulsion system design. <laughs> and it's no surprise, really, that that's where operational fires started. That is kind of our key technical challenge to date. How do we design a energy-aware, robust uh, system for experimental-type payloads? Uh, standard solid rocket motors are very point design, right? It's like a match. You light it, it burns until it stops burning, and you, you get to very little say in between. And so how can we change that, right? How can we regain control? How can we build a resilient rocket motor um, that can stand up to some of the changes in the experimental payloads that we're trying to fly? Um, so that's really where, where we're focused right now over the next 24 months. Thank you. Well, we covered a lot of ground in the last hour uh, from autonomous systems that elicit behaviors that help us determine intent to aircraft flying without control surfaces, uh, air-launched UAVs and networking tactics for weapons, uh, swarms and how we develop tactics to more effectively utilize those. Um, we've covered a, a lot of topics in both the air and ground domains, but as I said at the beginning of the hour, I hope that this is just the start of a conversation Certainly all of the best ideas and uh, best programs at DARPA have been dependent on the efforts from all of you. Um, your insights and your efforts in making a program success are vital. And so we'd like to engage with all of you even after D60. Certainly this event is a great place to start the conversation. Our website though has other resources including biographies and areas of interest for each of our program managers and a means of contacting them through the website. It's also where we publish things like uh, requests for information, broad agency announcements. Um, and if there's ever anything that you're trying to pursue that you feel passionately about, that this is going to be the game changer and you can't find a single program manager who will talk to you about it, come talk to Fred and I about coming to DARPA as a program manager. Um, one of the things that keeps DARPA fresh and keeps it constantly pursuing new ideas is people don't stay here very long. Typically, program managers come in for a couple of years. Uh, they may be extended for a few years after that if their project warrants it. Uh, but we're always hiring new program managers to take the place of those who are cycling out. And so Fred and I are, are interested in talking to people who are passionate, uh, who have a unique new insight, and who want to go change the world. And with that, I'd like to thank our panelists, as well as all of you, for coming this morning. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of D60. Thanks.